The Ontario chapter of the CIO Association of Canada gathered together at the IBM Innovation Centre in Toronto last week to discuss Web 2.0 and Gen Y in the workplace. The two-part event included a keynote and Q&A led by Infotech Research Group, followed by a panel discussion between CIOs and Gen Y students from Ryerson University. There seems to be a lot of fear that goes along with social networking, a lot of uncertainty in, as a CIO from an enterprise perspective, how do we use this stuff? Compared to what we normally have to deal with as, as IT professionals, these things are different. I mean, it's not like a, an ERP that you install, has a predefined purpose, predefined information flows, predefined usages. Uh, everything is predetermined and that allows you to set up some certain controls or expectations before the, the system ever goes live. This is an enabling set of technologies. You can't really anticipate how it's going to be used. You put it out there and you may find that the value it will come from unintended sources. But it requires interactive participation. So it's one of those things where you want collaboration, but you have to engage people in order to participate in these, in these net networks. Social networking is causing people to become more isolated from each other in terms of reducing the amount of human interaction. And I only mention this because in my view, as soon as the technology reaches the point where people are talking about how it's detrimental to us, there must be a clue there to how it might be useful to us uh, in terms of business value. This is not just a technology that seems to appeal to what we might regard as the young generation, you know, people like my daughters, but it's also uh, growth in the 30 and 40 something segment. So that tells us that the people that are working with us and for us are likely using this as a medium to stay connected to, to their peer groups, to, to their interest groups. This stuff is fairly easy to install and to use. So the other message is that if you're not out in front of this, somebody else in your organization may be. This is how do you make sure that people are contributing in a positive fashion in these things? And often uh, you think about something like Wiki, uh, Wikipedia, which has gone through this kind of thing, where they've kind of gone through, do we police it rigorously, or do we let, let anything go? And it's kind of established a nice balance of self-policing, you know, people kind of calling out, you know, you, you can't publish that there, that's absolute nonsense, you, you can't monitor, monitor what people say over the telephone, or how they're using the telephone, are they using it for business purposes or personal purposes? I, I think that by setting a tone and perhaps a policy, and then we'll get to some of the recommendations, and that would be one of them, is at least set up what you view the rules of engagement are at the outset. Can you prevent people from misusing it? No, you can't prevent people from misusing any corporate asset if they really intend on, on doing it. They talk about social networks as being a bottom-up phenomenon. People, it's a grassroots kind of movement. But if you want it to be successful in your organization, have to kind of support it from the, from the top. So someone from GM at an EVP level who's engaging in blogs sets a terrific role model for the rest of the organization. And you want to make Web 2.0 work, make it integrated with the daily routine. Um, make it part of the, the work that people are doing. Uh, if, if, it is, if it becomes additive, if it becomes an afterthought, when time pressures uh, occur, it's going to get dropped and your participation is going to fall, the opportunity is going to fail. So if you're going to be creating a professional network, encourage people not to use the same, uh, you know, ID identification as they might be using um, uh, on personal. You've got this trust network. You know, you've got people that are rallying around a common type set of issues, a common set of ideas, and they're contributing to that. The value of a network can quickly diminish when people from outside the community start to dabble. I mean, you lose that trust factor, you lose some of that credibility. You can't always anticipate what the right fit or use for a social network might be. So the best uses might come from your best users or your best knowledge workers. They'll probably figure out a use for a social network before you will. 
but the role of, of, of a CIO is to figure out how to help them scale. Uh, you know, when they figure something out, when they start a small social network or something seems to be taking off, how do you figure, how do you put enough uh, support around it to make sure that it succeeds? We're segueing here from um, social media to people that live, eat, and breathe that uh, social media, the generation Y. And, and who are they? And, and why are we talking about them? Well, they're different. And it's not because you know they're at Ryerson University or they're smart or anything, but this generation is different. Second, we need this generation. It's an odd thing. And some of you know the Coalition for ICT Skills, and they did a study with the Conference Board of Canada last year. 89,000, 89,000 jobs that will be open and unfilled in about the next three or four years in ICT. We generate about 4,000, if we're lucky, ICT trained professionals out of colleges and universities every year. 89,000 for big gap. Third reason, our economy and our prosperity as a city, a province, a region, and a, and a nation requires the skills and the capabilities that this next generation has. Toronto is the third largest ICT center in North America. New York, Los Angeles, or Silicon Valley, one and two, we're number three. We've done nothing about that. And I think that's going to change. If you read Richard Florida's stuff and uh, the stuff that's coming at the University of Toronto, forget General Motors, forget manufacturing. Um, it's the digital uh, economy that is, is our future. And again, these are the people that are going to be carrying this into that, that digital economy. You expect direct contact, constant feedback, um, frequent communications, coaching, mentoring, um, a high degree of trust. The case study that's in front of you, and you do get a chance to read it, I recommend you read it. Um, it's all about the 22-year-old feeling that he is on a peer level with the CEO. One thing I just want to observe about this is, I don't think this is different at all. I think all workers have always felt that way. The difference is not expectations, it's hope. So the old, in the old days, we'd hope for this, but don't really expect it. <laughs> Today's generation expects it. Okay. I know the separation of, of personal and, and, uh, and business, but the, the reality is, is the really blended with the Blackberry situation. People on it all the time, but, but we want that time back. You know, we want to be able to say, yes, you tell us to do something and we'll get it done. But it's not going to be the way it's been done for the past mm -hmm. while. Each of you start out in your, your careers, and this is now regular employment, you're not going to be going back to school. How long are you planning to stay with that, uh, that first company that you're, you're going into? Uh, 374 days. <laughs> <laughs> reasonable to, you know, you're going to exchange ideas and share ideas on Facebook about the, the new project that you're working on? What do you think? Sure. That's it. Okay. I don't, I don't see why not. The only problem that I have with Facebook is it's really difficult to search information out there. It's up there. Okay. You can go back and look through those conversations. They're really cumbersome. You know, Facebook is probably not the not the place where I would do it from a privacy perspective, just doesn't feel like, but there are other, you know, kind of ad hoc spin up your own places like Ning and, uh, um, you know, LinkedIn groups who could be in other places as well. And uh, yeah, right now we're experimenting with Twitter, for example, to uh, start opening up the organization and share ideas across the organization. And that one's, you know, even a little more scary because that is out there in the public. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, you know, we feel like that's part of making us human, is that we're able to expose our faults. Uh, we don't use Facebook, but we have for quite some time now used professional learning communities, and we have a closed environment, and it's, it's, it's the way our teachers work now. It's really important, not just within our school, but outside the school. So it's uh, Facebook, um, it's never really come up as a option that they really want to pursue. Uh, I think that most of our, our community, our uh, teachers, see that as a personal, a personal area. I, I see more of, uh, you were mentioning private networks and closed networks, internal to an organization might be more useful for that. Uh, uh, to, even if you look, for example, at uh, LinkedIn versus Facebook, there's a clear separation of the two. And, um, and I, don't, I don't think people want to to break that barrier and make it one whole world. But, but this is how people work, this is how I work. In our school projects, uh, the people that I have worked with, I mean, we, we've used social networking, uh, much like Facebook, uh, but, but more closed uh, in all of our projects, and that's how we'll work going forward, I'm sure. Okay. Let me